first actor Michael Robbins, who starred in the hit comedy series On the Buses, talks about a place that is for him a little piece of heaven. This is the Slipper Chapel outside Walsingham in Norfolk. Pilgrims have been coming here for centuries, taking off their shoes and walking the holy mile to Walsingham's shrines. It's a place of mystery and of mysticism, not the sort of spot you would associate with an actor best known for playing parts which he describes as rather downmarket gentlemen. Characters such as Arthur in the classic comedy series On the Buses. That bedroom's unhygienic. Oh, blimey, Mum, it's not all that bad. Yes, it is. It hasn't been done for nine years. Yeah, it was patched up for our wedding. Everything was patched up for our wedding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. You didn't have your operation till two years later. <laughs> Will you give over about my operation? Look, mate, let's get back to the bedroom. It's quite disgusting. If you saw it in broad daylight, you'd have a shock. I did. I went in your bedroom yesterday and she was prancing around in her roll-ons. Oh, did you all prance around in my roll-ons? Certainly not. When you got them on, you can hardly move. <laughs> For Michael Robbins, actor, comedian and star of countless television plays and films, a little piece of heaven can be found here, among the holy shrines of Walsingham. Yes, it's very moving. You know why the crosses are here. No, tell me. Tell yeah. Me at the end of the war, a group of, um, it was started off by a Dominican, the idea actually, as a reconciling of the nations after that awful war. Um, men walked from all points of England with bearing crosses, stopped overnight at a parish and were fed and housed, and then moved on the next day saying the rosary. And they all arrived here at Walsingham, and this is what these crosses are, which I think is very moving. Michael, have you been a Roman Catholic all your life? Yes, I was born a Catholic. My father and mother were strict Baptists, and uh, through the influence of uh, friends in my... My father was a bank clerk in the city. He then came into the church, and my mother came to the church. Strangely enough, my eldest sister was a Catholic before they were, because she was born before they'd finished their instruction. So, obviously, they had her baptised in the yes. church, so, in fact, she was a Catholic before them. Then the two of his, two of my father's sisters became Catholics and one of them entered Carmel the year I was born. Became so she nun. was a Carmelite nun mm. for 60 years. She died about two years ago of cancer. Um, it was a very happy upbringing. And a devout family? Very devout. Um, you see, I first came here just before the war and we evacuated to Hitchin in Hertfordshire from London. And uh, the altar servers were given a treat by the parish priest, and we were taken to Hunt Stanton. I've got a photograph of me and my brother at both ends of these, all with caps still on, ties on and whatnot. And it is then, after that, we did the holy bit and came to Walsingham. That was my first. Were you, were you personally devout as a small boy? I think so. In fact, um, well, I was... I wasn't a holy boy, if you mean that, but uh, the faith meant that, you know, the faith meant something to it me. It was then. real to you, I mean, Oh, you, yes. You did consider ordination, didn't you, at one time? In fact, yes. As a young boy, I went to, thank God, actually, they don't exist anymore, but I went to a junior seminary at the age of 14, and I say, thank God, they don't exist anymore. The church and its wisdom decided that that was quite a good thing. Um, but uh, after two years, I found I was pretty certain I actually didn't have a vacation. I think the Southwark Diocese were quite relieved when I went. Um, <laughs> and uh, I came back home, and I worked in a bank, would you believe? If I'd stuck it out, I'd probably be chairman of Lloyd's Bank now. But instead, I think I became, that would have suited you well. I became an actor instead. When you were considering ordination, did you find the idea of being a celibate hard to accept? 
No, not really at the time. Of course, it's become quite an issue now. You know, I have lovely priest friends. Uh, celibacy is something that has to be a positive thing. In other words, uh, Michel Coist, whom his Prayers of Life book is my sort of second Bible, has a beautiful prayer called A Priest on a Sunday Night, where he talks of after the evening mass, watching the young couples go off hand in hand and the young ones with families and the old. And he says, Lord, I'm a man too. I'm willing to give up this through clenched teeth, but the rest of you please occasionally offer me a hand of friendship. But doesn't the church's attitude appear rather unbending? I think it's rapidly changing, and I think it will change altogether. I think a celibate, I think there'll be two. There'll be a celibate clergy and a, perhaps the monastic orders, because in fact they make a vow of chastity. Um, for a secular priest, for crying out loud, it's only a rule of the church, and it was only brought out in the 14th century. So it's not an article of faith or anything, it's just a rule. And a secular priest merely vows to his bishop that he will remain celibate, so that, you know, that can be changed at any time. Michael, do you have a picture of what heaven's really like? Somewhere like here, I hope. It's rather nice, because it's going to be a big surprise. All I know is that I trust him implicitly. And don't forget, we're dealing with an infinite being, and we, we're only children with very finite minds, so we can't... You know, people find it difficult to think, think about eternity. They think, God, whatever it's like, I don't want it to go on and on and on and on forever. I don't know, in all our lives, things happen, don't they? Whether it's uh, listening to a beautiful piece of music or having a lovely day with someone or your first tender love or, or whatever, and you say, oh, God, I wish this could go on forever. If you think of all the, the loveliest things that have happened to you in your life and sort of multiply them by three trillion or something, I mean, that is childish, I know, but I'm quite content to leave what heaven is going to be like in God's own. Michael, we've asked you to choose a reading for us. What have you chosen? Um, I looked through my um, holy section of my library at home and I found this book of prayers which I hadn't sort of opened for a long time. Prayers from all over the world, from all dates and all sorts of people. And the one I chose was my, written by my hero, one of my great heroes, Thomas More. And he wrote this particular prayer a week before they took his head off. What, what is it about Thomas More that makes him particularly important for you? Well, you see, the last thing he wanted was to be martyred. But he was such a, a gay man in the old meaning of the word, um, such a merry man, brilliant mind, and such a brave man. Always been the hero. Glorious God, give me grace to amend my life and to have an eye to my end without begrudging death, which to those who die in you, good Lord, is the gate of a wealthy life. And give me, good Lord, a humble, lowly, quiet, peaceable, patient, charitable, kind, tender and pitiful mind in all my works and all my words and all my thoughts to have a taste of your holy, blessed spirit. Give me, good Lord, a full faith, a firm hope and a fervent charity, a love of you incomparably above the love of myself. Give me, good Lord, a longing to be with you, not to avoid the calamities of this world, nor so much to attain the joys of heaven, as simply a love of you. And give me, Lord, your love and favour, which my love of you, however great it might be, could not deserve were it not for your great goodness. These things, good Lord, that I pray for, give me your grace to labour for. Well, Michael, here we are in this beautiful little chapel. Do tell us what, what this is. Well, this is the slipper chapel. And as the uh, word denotes, this is where pilgrims, since 1016, when the shrine to Our Lady was first built, 
pilgrims from all over Europe, monarchs, nobility, everyone. So some of them maybe had travelled on foot hundreds and hundreds of miles, and they would stop at various chapels en route. But this was the final stopping place before they went to the shrine. And this is where they removed their slippers and walked barefoot the last mile, the holy mile. Do pilgrims still do that? Oh, yes. I, um, I did it myself in 1939, sir. That's it. Well, you've been coming here a long time. Yeah. But why is Walsingham important to you? Well, I suppose basically because our lady's important to me. I actually always called her my lady. It has a nice medieval ring to it. Um, she was, after all, the mother of God. And she, at the cross, at the foot of the cross, Christ bequeathed her to us as our mother. Our Lady of Walsingham, um, because I've been here on pilgrimage, I haven't, to my shame, yet been to Lourdes, but there are many shrines to Our Lady all over Europe. But a lot of people see Walsingham in the paper and news of confrontation between Christians. What do you feel about that? Well, it's very sad, but uh, I would suggest to you that it's only a handful, a very small handful, because, God bless them, your, um, your branch, <laughs> you know, same firm, different branch, your branch, the Anglicans, in fact, uh, as you know, the dissolution of the monasteries and the Reformation, sadly, Walsingham was raised to the crown. And it was the Anglicans in uh, the 19th century who started up the shrine again in Walsingham. And then we Catholics followed. But uh, there's never, I mean, it's, it's, there's such harmony here at the face, and thank, you know, thank God for that. But, but the trouble is people say, well, they're the Christians being beastly to each other again. I know. Well, as I say, I repeat, it's sad. Um, the whole thing about um, the split in Christendom is a scandal, it's obscene, it's blasphemous. Thank God we're coming together now. Um, all the old bigotries and misunderstandings, because it was mostly misunderstandings. I mean, devotion to Our Lady herself. Lots of people think we worship her. We don't worship her, she's not God. But God did choose her to be his mother. And being a mother, one prays to her quite a lot, because it's a very human thing. You can sometimes get things out of your mother that you can't get out of your dad, if you see what I mean. Or perhaps the Lord, you know, the Lord must be rather busy, mustn't he? So you have a quick word with that lady and say, boy, can you get your son to do this for me? <laughs> I mean, it's a very human thing, in fact. It's a lovely picture. But we don't worship her. She's not God. People come to Walsingham, of course, to pray for relief from suffering. And there are some remarkable things documented here on the... The miracles that happened. I understand there was a reputed one here in 1973 of a young schoolgirl. But of course, Lourdes is famous for its miracles, but that isn't the main ob object of the exercise. Obviously, it, it, I mean, the miracles are a bonus. If suddenly you're cured of cancer, or if suddenly you get out your wheelchair, you've been paralyzed all your life, and you get up and walk, uh, because the Lord through Her Lady, or Her Lady through Our Lord, has, has done that for you. I mean, Christ in his time went around curing people, so it's, you know, it's nothing new. Uh, but that's a bonus. The miracle of these places is the spiritual healing that you get. But I think some people find miracles a problem, don't they? I mean, why should God be so partial and cure one person and not cure another? Are you questioning God, sir? I, I'm asking... <laughs> I, I think I'm asking a question which a lot of yeah, people... Yeah, why, why... Well, it's like the gift of faith, isn't it? Why, why, why am I lucky I've got the gift of faith and you've got a gift of faith and lots of people just can't bring themselves to believe? Um, the Lord never pressurizes. I mean, he didn't create us as robots. We've all got a free will. We can make a choice either to believe or not to believe. And uh, that belief, too, is, is, you know, you don't suddenly become a Christian. That's a hat you put on, and that's the end of it. It's something you work at continually. It's not like a marriage. Well, Mike, you and I are lucky enough to be able to get up and walk. Perhaps that's what we should do, is go and walk some of this holy mile. That's a lovely Shall we idea. do that? Yeah, Richard. Thank you.
incredible to think about the number of people who've actually walked here before us. I know, tonight. one can feel it. Wonderful. Do you think today that there is a continuing value in pilgrimage? Oh, yes. I mean, the proof is that they still flock to Lua, to Loreto, to here. I mean, every week there's a, a new set of pilgrims arrive. So what, what are people doing when they go on pilgrimage, do you think? I think recharging their batteries. Um, places of pilgrimages are holy places and you can feel God there you know, in a very special way. Mike, we've asked you to choose a piece of music for us. Mm -hmm. What are we going to hear? Well, I, I thought obviously it had to be a, a hymn to Our Lady. And I've chosen Liszt Ave Maria, which is a little less known than the Gruner and the Park. And I've chosen the recording by Westminster Cathedral Choir School. Um, I wrote to uh, the television company to tell them my choice and tell them the number of the record. And I said the fact that my son was a chorister at the time and that the master of music was a cousin of mine had no bearing on the choice of my music at all. You mean you're not on a percentage? I'm not on a percentage. Uh, with you, Mike, I find that <laughs> difficult to believe. I really do. <laughs> Michael, here we are in the Anglican Shrine. Yes. It is so lovely, isn't it? Can I ask you, you seem to me to be somebody who's played a lot of rogues in your, your acting career. I have had my fair share, yes. How do you feel about that, being portrayed as somebody who's a bit of a rogue? What is my job as an actor? I mean, the good and bad people in the world. Um, I occasionally play baddies. Have you, ever, have you ever turned a part down because of the character you were asked to play? No, luckily I've only been sort of faced once, I think, with the... to have to make a, a moral decision of my own. Um, a play was sent to me in the post by a gentleman who had young people in his care or a don from the university. And it was pornographic from beginning to end. I just couldn't believe it. I wrote back and said I was rather appalled, but then he sent me back another one. Um, but that's the only time I've ever had to sort of stand up and say, no, I can't do that, I'm sorry. The rest of the time, it's been uh, innocuous um, seaside postcard humour on the buses and whatnot, which, to my mind, I have nothing to apologise for. And I've done some rather lovely, moving, serious plays. The acting profession has the reputation of putting a strain on family life. Has this happened in your case? No, it hasn't, luckily. I have the most beautiful, supportive wife, who is also an actress. Um, for some uh, showbiz marriages, it is better that you're both in the business because you both know what the other one's up to and you can't get away with anything. Um, I've also um, had the delightful privilege of two lovely children. Benedict, who, as I say, was a chorister at Westminster Cathedral and is now a recording engineer. Um, and a brilliant musician, and Sarah, our daughter, who has given us beautiful grandchildren. Did you make your children laugh a lot when they were little? Um, without trying, I think, a lot of the time, <laughs> yes. 
Um, it, you know, haven't asked me, but that uh, little medallion is an uh, emblem of the Grand Order of Water Acts, which I'm very privileged to belong to. And the second year I was in the order, I was given the trophy Rat of the Year. And I still can't work out why my wife was so amused by this. <laughs> now, what a terrible thing do you have to do to be the Rat of the Year? Be the best. Be the best. That's be you. good. I, oh, well, then I see. That's very good. And do you have to spend a great deal of time, have you had to spend a great deal of time apart from your family, though? Not a great deal, no. I mean, only very recently have I, I mean, an odd film away for a few weeks or something. And only in the last few years I've started to do a bit of touring, but top whack, ten weeks, and uh, unless one's in Edinburgh, I get home at weekends. Mike, if I said to you, well, here we are in the Anglican Shrine, you've got one wish of the Blessed Virgin, what would it be? Um, it always sounds a cliché, and it's the usual thing that actors say, but to keep the work rolling in and please Our Lady. I, I did, two years ago, the national tour of a play called A Month of Sundays, which was the proudest thing I've ever done. It's the most moving, funny, moving play about two old men. One, his mind was going, the other one, the body was going. I um, would love to have the chance to play that again. What was the theme of that? It was about two fighters who refused to give in. In my case, incontinence was setting in. In the other case, uh, my friend Aylott, the mind was going. And uh, it was written by Bob Larby, who's one of our most prolific sitcom writers. It was his first play, and it got the West End Evening Standard Award for the best play. Um, so that when it became, not heavy, but when it became a bit too moving, being this marvellous comedy writer, you hit him in the... You hit him with a, not a belly laugh, but a bit of laughter. That's very, again, a, I think being with you, what I have noticed, there's always this tremendous sense of humour that comes bubbling up to the top in you. It's well, I've always believed it's one of the greatest gifts God has given us, is the gift of laughter. Um, I suppose the apostles were too busy trying to remember details of Christ's life and the serious side of it, and we, there are not many jokes in the Gospel, are there? Um, but I'm sure that Christ had a great sense. I'm sure the parables, for instance, were full of homely in-jokes at the time. Do you find that people believe that humour and God don't go very well together? No. Uh, um, I go occasionally to the Benedictine Monastery, Cor Abbey, on the Isle of Wight, and you'd be surprised at how many um, actors go there. Um, and I was walking up and down with the Father Prior once, and he, you know, found out who I was, what I did and whatnot. And I said, we were talking about humour. And I said, why is it that um, if something funny happens inside a holy church, it's funnier than it happened? He said, what do you mean, Michael? I said, well, I mean, if you break wind in church, it is somehow funnier. You know, as an altar server, I remember doing it. He, you can't stop laughing. And he said, I know exactly what you mean. He said, when I came here as a young monk, they were burying the uh, then Father Abbott. And we solemnly processed out the church to the graveside. And Brother Gravedigger hadn't dug the grave quite long enough, and it stuck. And Father Pryor tried to help it in with his foot, and he fell in. <laughs> so, yes, you see, God must have a sense of humor, otherwise, he wouldn't put up with evil. <laughs>